should ask. Because you know how billionaires are better than us and they're really smart? Of course. I mean, they have so much money, it must mean they have bigger brains. So is there any billionaire that maybe we could ask for, for his uh, ideas on how to solve the China-Taiwan issue? Hey, what about that Elon Musk guy? He's sort of a freewheeling, free speech uh, kind of guy. Surely he has no hidden dark side. Shelly, why are you laughing? I bet Elon Musk has a great idea of how to resolve the China-Taiwan issue. Let's not put billionaires in charge of foreign policy, please. Well, so so Elon Musk did actually have a great recommendation, which he told the Financial Times uh, about a week ago. He said, my recommendation would be to figure out a special administrative zone for Taiwan that is reasonably palatable, probably won't make everybody happy. And it's possible, and I think probably, in fact, that they could have an arrangement that's more lenient than Hong Kong. Like, come on, like, like you're saying, hey, free independent country, I got a great idea. How about you become a special administrative region of an authoritarian regime? I'm sure they will definitely respect your autonomy. They have a great track record. Yeah, one country, two systems. I mean, when has that ever failed? <laughs> I like also that he specifically says that he thinks they could get a better arrangement than Hong Kong. Well, I, I think that in a way he's right that the Communist Party would certainly promise a better arrangement than Hong Kong. Than Hong Kong's original arrangement or Hong Kong's current arrangement? Well, than Hong Kong's current arrangement. Well, yes, of course, they would promise something better than that because Hong Kong's current arrangement would basically be like, well, we're going to come in, take over everything and silence everybody and, and terrorize the people. Because Hong Kong was never even a British colony. It was only controlled. Remember the Chinese official who said like they would need to do a lot of re-education in Taiwan when they take over? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I, don't, I don't think this is, I think Elon Musk might actually be an idiot. Well, it, it just comes back to how sometimes really smart people can also be really stupid because, you, you know, Elon Musk has been very successful in a lot of things. And, you know, when you are that successful, it blinds you to your own shortcomings. And like he, he is, he has been brilliant when it comes to uh, electric vehicles and marketing electric vehicles. And, and marketing flamethrowers. And, and, and perfume. And, and, what? He's selling perfume now. You don't know about this? I don't. But yeah. Smell like Elon Musk? Oh my God. Is it, it called it's Musk a, Musks? No. Well, he, he made a joke about with a name like his, he should have gotten into the perfume industry, you know, years ago. What was he fighting? And I don't remember what the perfume's called, but it's something weird. Musk. No, it's not called Musk. But the, the point is that like, okay, so, you know, in-, in, in Burnt uh, hair. Burnt hair. That's the worst smell. But like, like, okay, so, so he so, sold millions of dollars e worth. E Elon Musk uh -huh. is a is a brilliant marketer. He has many other skills too, but like, he's a brilliant marketer, right? Because think about how he's been able to be involved in U.S. politics to get essentially the U.S. convince the U.S. government to massively subsidize cars for the wealthy, right? Yes, it, that's true. It, like, that's the whole business model of Tesla. And, and and even though there's an obvious disconnect as soon as you think about it, he's really good at that stuff. And he he thinks that he understands how politics works. And to a degree he does in the US, but what he doesn't understand is that the Chinese Communist Party is not a normal government. It can't be reasoned with. They will break promises that they make to you even if they pinky swear, even a pinky swear. I mean, he also had a stupid idea for Ukraine and Russia, so. Right. You know, it's it, so he's just he just doesn't he's not good at that. And I think my point is because he's so brilliant in many ways and because he's been so successful in so many ways, he really can't see his massive blind spots when it comes to dealing with these authoritarian regimes. Well, especially like he is, you know, deeply in bed with the Chinese Communist Party, with Tesla in China, like the, those cars which are being Subsidized by the U.S. government, rely on Chinese companies making the electric batteries that those cars need. Right. With getting the cobalt from all those nice little African children in the Congo and the mines. Well, I think someday the CCP is going to nationalize Tesla. Yeah. And then we'll see how Elon Musk feels.
and about. but like I really am not comfortable with this guy like potentially owning a, you know one of the biggest social media companies. I'm not really comfortable with him making like you know the space vehicles for the U.S. military. Like I mean, a guy who's very very. Who else is going to be it? Jeff Bezos? Is that better? That's not better. It's not better. Michael Bloomberg? Not better. You know the problem is these rich elites. <laughs> if only the workers would rise up. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, if only we had a, a supreme leader of these United States who had a, you know, a, a real a real grasp on how to do things right. I can do. Yeah, I would know what to do. Just give me absolute power. Trust me, you're going to love it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have the trust of the people. The people. And so the people, you, you also trust the people. That's why you have the trust of the people, right? And I understand them. And yes. they understand me. Yeah. But I think the problem with Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Michael Bloomberg is the same that, you know, happens. Not You don't have to be a billionaire to be an idiot about the Chinese Communist Party. Like a lot of, um, sadly, the U.S. foreign policy establishment, like for years, right, decades, was like, okay, we can make nice with the CCP. Mm -hmm. And there's still elements of that? Oh. There's still elements in the Commerce Department? There's definitely. And oh. I think there's this idea that, like, the whole um, end of history thing, right? Where like we can all work together for a uh, rules-based international order. Like now that the Cold War is over, there's no bad guys anymore. Straight road to Star Trek Federation. Well, but yeah. what, but there's there's now this sort of bigger global goal that a lot of people have, which is fighting climate change. And while that's a noble idea, uh, the problem is that it it makes people believe that uh, because we as Americans believe we're all in this together and all nations need to work together to fight climate change, that therefore the the governments of every other nation also share that view that this is important because without stopping climate change, you know, we're all going to be flooded or or you know the uh, farming is going to be disrupted, et cetera, et cetera. So this is important to a lot of Americans. It's not important to the Chinese Communist Party, which just, they, they may not even, even though they say they care about climate change, they, they actually may not care at all. And even if they do care, it's so far down on their agenda. Climate change is not something that the CCB talks about in their internal propaganda to the Chinese people. No, like, but that's they talk not... about it. Xi Jinping will talk about it at Davos or, or you know, in meeting with other leaders because they understand it's a leverage point. No, yeah. What I'm saying is I don't they they don't care. You're right. Right. And and so you know, Americans and, and a lot of people in the US government mistakenly believe that we because we need to work with every country on climate change to make an impact that therefore- Especially the country that's responsible for most of the pollution and environmental destruction in the world. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's most. But I don't they, think it's actually most. They, well, well, well here's, here's, here's the most part. Fishing destruction, the, 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 the Chinese, Yeah, they're, the Chinese- <laughs> That somehow doesn't claim it. Chinese counts. fishing is well, by far the worst. That doesn't count as climate change. So environmental destruction yeah. is what I said. Well, but the like the- China has built more- coal-powered uh, power plants than the rest of the world combined in the last few years. That's true. Uh, that's not a country that policy-wise is is moving in a in a carbon-neutral direction. So, but my point is that that just because we feel that every country needs to work together, like that shouldn't blind us to the reality that that's never going to happen, no matter how much wishful thinking we have. And there are ways to deal with uh, pollution uh, and climate change without uh, relying on China. Uh, but, you know, th this idea that like we just have to work with China and therefore we have to have policies that give us this, this way to involve China, like it's, it's just going to end up hurting us so much. And it's actually going to be worse for the climate than trying to just take matters into our own hands with the U.S. and other Western countries. If right? Americans work together, we can finally destroy the climate ourselves. Well, that's that's a beautiful sentiment. But but my, my, my point is that like, if we want to be serious about fighting climate change, uh, we can't rely on China, which is building 
coal-fired power plants. We should, for example, move more manufacturing back to the U.S. where we have a regulatory environment uh, that is uh, requiring cleaner energy. And if you have manufacturing in a country like the U.S. or in Europe where uh, you have less pollution per kilowatt, then uh, you are actually uh, reducing carbon emissions. You are uh, improving the environment with also without relying on China. Well, I don't think the problem is just that we rely on China to do things. I think it's also that, well, look at what happened with the Paris Climate Agreement, right? Where the agreement is essentially that like developed countries like the US will restrict uh, their carbon emissions, but uh, countries like China will not because they get another decade amazing or something. they were able to get China to agree to that deal. Well, I mean, I think if they didn't say that, they wouldn't have agreed to the deal, right? Yeah. So it's not just about like relying on China to do things, but it's making concessions. Right. It, things that hurt American industry. It's, it's basically like if all three of us agreed that we're going to go on a diet and lose weight, uh, but like my agreement with you guys is that I will also go on this diet, but mine's going to start in the year 2060. And meanwhile, Chris and I are responsible for losing all the weight of three people. That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, as Supreme Leader, this is one of my policies. I understand that the climate is a myth. <laughs> there, there's no climate. There's no climate. <laughs> so I won't fall for those tricks. Ah, very good. Too smart. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, I mean, it's not just climate change, though. To your point, Matt, like that that whole thing that you just use climate change as an example of it's what happens with anything where we're like, we need the Chinese Communist Party to get on board with with stopping fentanyl coming into the U.S. with stopping human trafficking. Like, yeah, maybe we we can just we can maybe work with them together on this sort of thing. It's in their interest, Shelley. It's in their interest. I don't think the U.S. government really understands what's in China's interests or what's in the Communist Party's interests, rather. No, they, they don't. But the CHIPS Act is definitely a very strong step in the right direction, in my view. I hate to keep saying this, but it's not the CHIPS Act. <laughs> what is it? it? Well, the CHIPS Act is a good thing, but that was the thing a couple was, months ago. Yeah, this with was Congress. a new executive order. The CHIPS Act was a uh, legislation. Yeah, that, yeah. The, that's, that's why I was getting them mixed up because you had said CHIPS Act and I was like, the legislation, Congress. I know, and then, and then I had to be like, it's not the CHIPS Act. <laughs> it's a new executive but, order. But Shelly, when you corrected me, I wasn't listening. I wasn't correcting you. I corrected Chris, but you weren't listening to that. And then I had to do it again, which made me feel bad. But yeah. yeah this, is, this is what happens when I don't listen to you. <laughs> Everything's fine. No skin off your back. Uh, but yeah, it, the reason I think that it's easier to think of it as the CHIPS Act is because the actual name for these rules are really long and boring. So yeah, there's not like chips. a good, there's not a good way to say like the new Biden administration's new semiconductor chip rules against China. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, moving forward, we're definitely going to be keeping a close eye on the black box that is the party congress and uh, it'll be very interesting to see what will or won't change based on xi jinping getting a third term in power uh, which i which seems very likely at this point that's going to happen uh, yeah i mean i think we can pretty much predict what the ccp is going to do because it's what they say they're going to do uh we'll just you know i mean like you know because we talk about how she, even if he gets his third term in power, he is not like completely secure in his position. There's still lots of uh, political infighting. There's uh, transparent problems that lots of people have, like the zero COVID stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that this is not the end of general hostility. Thankfully, no, because I love that show. And I mean, since I'm such a fan of it, I would love to have a t shirt about general hostilities. But wait, there is a t-shirt that you can get at chinaincensored.tv slash merchandise. Help support our work. 
by putting on clothes. You're doing so well. I think that's a good slogan. Help support our work by putting on clothes. Yeah, versus, you know. Nobody else has that slogan, Shelley. As, as Mark Twain said, oh, I forget exactly what he said. It was a clever line about how, like, naked people, you should dress well because naked people rarely are listened to or something like that. It was, yeah. he was very clever. I am less clever. Now I desperately want to look that up and see if it's real. Uh, well, I definitely saw on the internet a picture of Mark Twain. With that quote with on With that quote. Okay. And if you need more proof than that, you're probably one of these climate people who thinks climate is real. I think, <laughs> I think we should make a t-shirt with Mark Twain's picture on it that says, I love general hostility. <laughs> wow, you said that? Yeah. <laughs> wow, cool. You should buy the general hostility t-shirt. I should buy our own merch. <laughs> that's, that's like taking a resource and diminishing it. I mean, it's not a finite. T-shirts are not a finite resource. They're an inf- well, you're, they're an infinite the general resource. hostility one is because it's only available for a limited time only. Yeah. So get yours today and don't be naked because Mark Twain hates naked people. 